In 1937, Rob began recording a series of 15-minute radio comedies for the BBC, with probably his most well-known character, Mr. Muddicombe J.P. Here is a later version of that audio sketch filmed for BBC TV. Have we many cases today? No, no, sir, not many. Things are very quiet, aren't they? Ah, they are, sir, very, very quiet, but I think it can be accounted for. Oh, in, in what way? Well, sir, since we've been closed, there's a new court opened up down the road in opposition. And they're running it on cut prices. Running it on what? Cut prices. How do you mean? Well, sir, take exceeding the speed limit in motoring cases, for instance. Now, now they've only been charging 15 and 6. What have we been putting them in at? A pound. Sometimes 25 shillings. What are they doing drunk and disorderly, is that? Uh, seven and six. What have we been charging? Ten and six. Where's our price list? Let's what? have a look at the price list. Yes, sir. Let's have a look at it. What, what, what are they getting for parking offences? Uh, park, uh, seventeen and six. We've been asking twenty shillings. Yes, sir. Well, they're not playing the game. Besides, they must be running at a loss. Well, it, it, it's very serious competition, sir. Well, we've got to compete. If they can show a profit at these prices, we've got to do the same. How long have they been open? About two months, sir. And uh, I have overheard it said, uh, uh, with all due respect, that, that you was a bit stiff. Who's a bit stiff? Oh, no, sir, no, sir. A bit stiff. Oh, a bit stiff. I didn't know what you were talking about. Why? How do, how do you mean? In, in what way? Well, sir, I was talking to a very, very old customer of ours the other day, and uh, he said, if you'll pardon me, sir. All right, go on. What did you say? Well, he said, he said, he said, it's time old Muddle come out a bit of opposition. What customer said that? Uh, his name's Bevington. Bevington, Be what, the drunken disorderly? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, we don't want to lose him. He's the most regular client we have. Well, he, he seemed very, very dissatisfied. So, you see, since we've been closed, he's been had up three times at the cut price court, and he says it's been a great saving to him. He says he's had three convictions at the same price as what two would have cost him here. What, what, what kind of a place is this cut price court? Oh, it's only a little place. Well furnished? Oh, no, no, it's very meagre. Of course, they've got the wireless in, but apart from that, it isn't what you might call palatial. They've got the wireless in? Oh, yes. Cinematograph? Oh, no, no not, not yet, sir. Where, where, where is it situated? It's in the high street, sir. Right next door to the Bull and Beaver. Oh, much more convenient. Oh, eh? much. Right in the high street? Yes. Oh, a better position than ours altogether, eh? Oh, very much better, sir. You say they've got the wireless in? Uh, yes, sir. All right, well, we'll get a television set. Oh, sir, but it'll cost an awful lot of money. Oh, I don't see that. We can get it on the how do you do, on the never... We, we can hire one. Yes, but, sir, you'd have to keep up the instalments. Oh, you'd be taking on an awful lot of worry, sir. Oh, you are a wet blanket, Wallace. You are here in my trying to work up the business and you stand there and, and throw cold water on it. Well, sir, I were only thinking. Well, you don't no want to think. We, we're not here to think. We, we, we've got to be enterprising. We've got to expand. We, we can't sit here and see a fully going concern fall to pieces before our very eyes. Well, sir, if, if we lost money last year, we shall have to go some this year. You see, we'd, we'd no serious opposition last session. In spite of opposition, we've got to win through. I'm going to make a success of this court, even if I have to bring fines down to 18 pence. And that's sinking pretty low. But no cut price courts are going to beat me. Ah, there's the spirit, sir. Where? Where is it? Where? No, 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 I was agreeing with you. Oh, I, I thought you were pointing to some kind of wish you'd be more careful. Oh, fancy. Well, well, you'll, you'll stick by me, won't you, Wallace? Aye, ah, through thick and thin, yes. sir. You won't go over to the opposition. I'll work for no cut prices. No, you're happy with me, aren't you, Wallace? Aye, sir, I look upon this dear old place as my home from home, nah, sir. Ah, that's the idea. Then we'll fight on. It may be a hard uphill battle, but we'll stick together. Um, now, what's the first case? Uh, uh, the first case, sir, uh, it's Michael Johnson. The prisoner is charged with having no visible means of support. He has uh, no shelter, no home, no friends, no food and no money. No money? Not a penny, sir. Take him to the cut price court. From one of Rob's most famous characters to his most famous sketch, the day war broke out. My missus said to me, she said, what good are you? It's a start to that most famous sketch that went out over the airways in 1942 and inspired a classic hit sitcom, Dad's Army. Dad's Army writers Jimmy Perry and David Croft later admitted that Rob was a massive influence on writing their hit sitcom. So here it is, 
the sketch that inspired Dad's army. The day war broke out, my missus looked at me and she said, What good are you? I said, how do you mean, what good am I? Well, she said, you're too old for the army. You couldn't get into the Navy and they wouldn't have you in the Air Force, so what good are you? I said, I'll do something. She said, what? I said, how do I know? I'll have to think. She said, I don't see how that's going to help you. You've never done it before, so what good I? I said, don't keep saying what good am I? I said, there'll, there'll be munitions. She said, now, how can you go on munitions? I said, I never said anything about going on. I said, there'll be some. Well, she said, all the young fellows will be getting called up, and she said, you'll have to go back to work. Oh, she's got a cruel tongue. Anyhow, I haven't had to go back to work. I'm a lamplighter. Now, then, then she said, now she said, our Harry, now she said, our Harry's sure to be getting called up. And she said, when he's gone, there'll only be his army allowance. And she said, what are you going to do then? I said, I'll have to try and manage on it. She said, you'll have to try and manage it. She said, what about me? I said, there'll be my insurance. She said, I can't get that till you are dead. I said, well, then you'll have to wait. She said, suppose I die first. I said, well, then you won't want it. But you can't reach his no brains. At Anyhow, I got fed up and I put my hat on and I went down to the local. Oh, the times that woman has driven me into the local. Now, when I, when I got in there, there was a fellow there. Oh, he was as tight as I've never seen. And there was another fellow with him just as tight. And one of them was sitting at a table trying to fill in a form. And he said to his pal, he said, Herbert, he said, what's the name of this street outside the pub here? He said, I've got to fill it in this for What's the name? The other fellow, just as tight, says, the name, the name of what? He said, the name of this street here, outside the pub here. What's the name of it? He said, oh, how the hell do I know? I've never been outside the pub. Now, but the, the first day I got me home guard uniform, I'm getting the trousers next year, but the first day I got I went home and I slipped upstairs and I put it on. And I came down into the kitchen and the missus looked at me and she said, what are you supposed to be? I said, supposed to be? I said, I'm one of the home guards. She said, one of the home... She said, what are the others like? And then the missus said, she said, well, what do you do in the home guards? I said, I've got to stop Hitler's army landing. She said, what, you... I said, no, there's Harry Bates and Charlie Evans and... I said, there's seven or eight of us all together. I said, we're in a group. I said, we're on guard in a little hut behind the dog and pull it. She said, well, what's the good of being on guard in a little hut behind the dog and pull... She said, I suppose that was your idea. I said, aye, and that Charlie Evans wants to claim it as his. And then she looked at me and she said, well, what are you doing with one stripe? She said, you've only just got the uniform. How can you have one stripe? I said, wait a minute and I'll explain the whole position. I said, as a matter of fact, Charlie Evans, Harry Bates and myself have got one each. She said, well, how did you come by them? And how did they? They've only just joined. I said, wait a minute, and I'll explain it. I said, Tom Briley, the sergeant, got all browned off, fed to the teeth, chucked it, and he gave us one each. Oh, I, oh, we've all joined for the duration. 
That's unless it finishes before then. We don't know, you see. But my missus, she gets on my neck. She asks such daft questions. She said, here, yeah. she said, only this morning, she said, what are you supposed to be guarding? I said, oh, don't start all that again. I said, we're guarding the British Isles. I said, we're guarding all the millions of men, women, and children. Millions of them. And you. She said, oh, then you're on our side. I said, well, of course I'm on our... Well, she said, I think we'd be a darn sight better off if you were on the other side. She said, do you, do you know this, Hitler? Have you ever... Do I know? I said, now, don't talk rubbish, Rita. Do I know Hitler? I would, I'm not even in the paint business or anything. I would... Well, she said... How are you going to know which is him if they do land? I said, I've got a tongue in my head, haven't I? But it's no good trying to reason, but she doesn't seem to concentrate. Only the other mo Oh, good gracious me, look at the time. No, I, sh I should have been on guard two hours ago. They'll be, they'll be looking for me everywhere. No, I'm... I've left the whole of the coast exposed. You'll, you'll have to forgive me. I really have to go. After the war, Rob was still a very popular performer. He was appearing in movies, on the TV, and on the radio. And even though he was in his 70s, he was still performing at the same level he had always done. This next clip shows Rob in fine form on one of the BBC variety acts in the 1950s. So the barman looks up at a shelf with some bottles on it. He said, well, now, wait a minute. He said, I've, uh, I've got it without vanilla. I've got it without lime juice. I've got it without lemon. But, he said, I've got it with peppermint. The other fellow said, oh, well, that's the very flavour I wanted it without. <laughs> Rob Wilton sadly died on the 1st of May, 1957, at the age of 75. But I think he would be proud that he is still fondly remembered by not just his generation, but also mine. And that almost 60 years after his death, he is still making people smile and inspiring comedians like myself to perform. I'll let Rob have the last word. Goodbye. <laughs> I tried to separate two women who were fighting in the street. I got between them and said, girls, do try and be discreet. A policeman came. They both escaped. He said, come on with me. He said, you caused the row. I said, me? How? He said, come on, we'll see. So I went before the magistrate and he fined me 20 bob. I said, how much? He said, a pound. I said, I'll, I'll have some job. I said, I can't pay it, governor. He said, who can't? I said, I can't. He said, you can't. I said, yes, I can, I can't. He said, oh, well, that alters my decision and you must go to prison and for 14 days you won't come out, you shan't. I said, what makes you say so? He said, say so, I should say so. He said, it took me years to start that little spree. One was my wife's mother, it was a dead cert on the other. Now all through you, she's back and lives with me.